Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode of No Such Things as Fish, where we are joined by the incredible Beck Hill. Now, who is Beck Hill, you ask? No, you don't, because you're already a listener to A Problem Squared, which is her amazing podcast that she does with mathematician and comedian Matt Parker, where they spend their time solving everybody's problems. You probably also know Beck through her YouTube channel. She's got all sorts of stuff on there. I think, notably, uh, you might know her for her flip chart comedy where she mishears lyrics. There's videos about her show, Makeaway Takeaway, that she used to do on CITV. There's loads of stuff on there. And, of course, if you're the right age or if you have children of the right age, you will know her from her books. She has a series of books called Horror Heights. There are three in the series at the moment. The latest is called Dead Ringer, and they are, of course, available in all places where you buy your books. So that's all about Beck. There will be a little thing later on, towards the end of the show, where we might have an object which we will sign and give away to one of our listeners. If you want to know more about that, you will have to sign up to Club Fish. We will give more details on how to win that during our next bonus drop as a line, which will be out next Tuesday. Anyway, not much more to say. I mean, we do have a live show coming up, which... I think the tickets might be all but sold out, but you can get streaming tickets from that. You can go to nosuchthingasafish.com forward slash podfest. Apart from that, really, this is the end. It's time to say, on with the podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Hoburn. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am sitting here with James Horrican, Andrew Hunter-Murray and Beck Hill. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is Beck. In 1927, a patent was filed for an apparatus designed to scare criminals into confessing their crimes by creating an optical illusion of a ghost skeleton. (laughs) (laughs) That'd do it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, the the patent was filed and I mean, it was granted in 1930. Okay. Uh, It expired in 1947. So if anyone wants to make that now. (laughs) That made Call of Duty better, wouldn't it? Where they're trying to get... Call is that duty. what happens? Line of duty? Of, line of duty. Call of duty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's that video game. It's, it is, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was oh just trying to work God. out how you fit there the... as well. I think it'd work everywhere. Pop a glowing skeleton. Sorry, we'll get yeah. we'll get messages from the gamers. It, it won't work in Call of Duty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, an intensely realistic war experience. Um, okay. It's, it's more a kind of like... Can you storm Normandy? Then uh, where were you on the night of the fourth? <laughs> Which is what this, um... More games need interrogation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Mario interrogation. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Peach? <laughs> I was reading about um, show jumping the other day. Oh, yeah. You know, in yeah. the Olympics, and in the first Olympic show jumping, part of it was just because we're talking about video games, mm. the horse had to walk along and people would roll barrels towards them and they'd have to jump over the barrels like in Donkey Whoa. Kong. Wow. Isn't that cool? cool? That's amazing. Yeah. Imagine if that was your job. <laughs> I the roll barrel. the barrels at horses. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, but this was off topic skeleton. so quickly. Skeleton. Yeah. Skeleton. Oh yeah, so it was, like, it was a light. Do you know what? I couldn't find out whether it was a real skeleton or a fake one. Mm. But given oh. the date, I'm, I'm guessing it was a, new, a real one, yeah. but it was a life-size skeleton with red glowing light bulbs in the eyes that would turn on and off to create the effect of blinking. Mm. Um. And it was lit from the top and the bottom. And basically the uh, the suspected criminal would be put into a, uh, a chamber, like a room that's mm. completely darkened. And then the interrogator would sit behind the skeleton and talk through a megaphone that would sort of come out of the skeleton's mouth mm. and the skeleton would be <sighs> lit a little bit to create the effect of a ghostly outline That's of amazing. Yeah. glowing Ooh. eyes. Yeah, yeah, and it's, and the effect, the idea was the criminal would go into a darkened room to begin with, so they're sort of going, what's going on? Where's mm. the police officers? What, what's happening? And then suddenly this curtain would raise and this furious yeah. glowing skeleton would be there <laughs> saying, you did it, didn't you? Or whatever it was. Yeah. It would work so well the first time 
on on I presume everyone who was who'd committed a crime and and was trying to cover it up. As in, it's a very striking experience to have if you're the one being you know questioned yeah. by a skeleton. But I guess the criminal fraternity would would be more. You know, yeah. we'd be blasé about it after a few years of the skeleton being. Well, everyone they'd have would to, know about it, wouldn't they? Well, yeah, yeah, they'd, they'd have to like, keep. Oh, on, yeah, just... They'd have to keep checking it out, and you know, maybe dress, different and, dress up the skeleton. Yeah. Or... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a detail in this which kind of confused me because this is the 1930s, which said that as well as having the the megaphone and the glowing eyes, it also mm. had a camera in the head yes. to film. Would you get sound recording as it well? It was to record sound as well, as, and it actually included a way of. Uh, recording the sound and the visuals at the same time yeah. onto this film yeah that is very early isn't it we had it photographs and we had cinema and stuff like that so mm, i think this yeah. it was a woman who did it wasn't it helen, yeah helen adelaide shelby was yeah her name. i think she basically took a load of things that had been invented around that time and said oh we could do this with this oh we could do this with this yeah. so, oh flashing lights let's do that for the eyes and stuff. yeah one thing i couldn't find out was her decision to turn it into an interrogation thing like that's quite a cool effect if mm. you were like oh we'll we could create this effect and put it on stage mm. what like did she just read a christmas carol and was like oh i know what gets people guilty <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but that's the thing Gross. as well she's she doesn't come from that background so it's um helena sorry not or helena um yeah. rather than helen and she she was a real estate mogul she was like, she used to bet on horses. There's, there's nothing else in the literature about her that suggests that this came from any background in policing or anything like that. And she kind of disappears as well. You don't really yeah. see I'm her. <laughs> I found that she did die in 1947. Right. I found in the newspapers. When it expired. I know. Oh. <laughs> and I found that her father-in-law, Samuel, was a famous Civil War veteran. His first foray in the Civil War was down the Mississippi River and the entire platoon was hospitalized because they all drank swamp water. Oh. That's all I found out. Right. <laughs> she had a husband called Edgar. That's the only yeah. other detail I've got. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Stop blinding us with overwhelming information. Yeah, about this. Yeah. It is, yeah, it is so random. Thing. It's all she's remembered for now is, is mostly this skeleton thing. I, I found out that uh, Tom Scott, the um, YouTuber, had um, recreated this, oh, this invention he? in 2020. So they recreated the actual skeleton and everything and did an oh, experiment yeah. with three other people where he left them alone with a cookie and one of them had to steal the cookie and then he interrogated them and they didn't know what he was doing. Uh -huh. So he was just like, I'm trying out a new technique. That's so funny. <laughs> and then he puts them in this room and the first two are scared at first because they're in a dark room and mm -hmm. they have no idea what to expect. And then when the skeleton appears, they just crack up laughing. Oh, <laughs> right, it's really? because... And cause, you would though, wouldn't you? I mean, I can imagine it being spooky at first, but I'd be far more scared of a dark room. Yeah. yeah. So you know the one-way mirror thing? Yeah. yeah. There's no, actually, there's no such thing as a one-way mirror. No, there is. It's actually a window. That's, uh, that's the dullest fact I found in the course of research. Wait, <laughs> it's to do with lighting. Do it's all about, yeah, lighting. Right? Yeah, it's a window covered with highly reflective coating. It's not a mirror. What makes the difference between a Is it just because a mirror has like a... a steel background i think the mirror yeah. has the, the that or yeah it's like a properly opaque background whereas with the one-way window as all the kids will be calling it a yeah, one-way yeah, window <laughs> <laughs> it's just a lighting thing the ow because <laughs> <laughs> the lights are always off aren't they in the room where the the senior cops are watching the questioning happen the, the lights are always dark in that yeah, room yeah, yeah, yeah. and if you turned on the lights in that room you'd see them the thing is that's Andy, it. is you want people to think it's a mirror right that's the whole point yeah. if you say we've got our window here <laughs> then they're gonna go oh I thought that was a mirror like you that's have to true. call it a mirror in order to keep up but everyone illusion. knows there are people behind there now do they? Yeah. yeah, yeah well, yeah. no, the question is, you don't know whether there's someone behind there or not. I can't the believe effect. they exist, actually. Do they exist? I've never been arrested yeah, I've and done interrogated. The, I've, um, Have you been interrogated? I, <laughs> what did you do? I used to work in market research, my first job. Oh. And um, we, there was a market research house, which was in Slough. Yes. And um, I was conducting the surveys. How interesting. Like the focus group stuff. Yeah, and it was all one-on-one -on -one stuff. It was with women between the age of 18 and 39 who had acid reflux. And... <laughs> They had to speak to me for an hour and a half each, and I had to ask them all the questions about their reflux. Oh, wow. Gosh. Yeah. And did you, you watch them watch? through a one-way mirror? Well, there were there were there were people from I'm not going to say which pharmaceutical giant were watching them through the window, uh -huh. uh, the mirror, whatever. Um, and they were in the they were in the next room. And after the interview ended, I'd pop next door and I'd say, "Was there anything else you wanted me to ask?" And they'd say, "Yeah, could you just ask question 17 again?" Okay, yeah. so this yeah. this woman, middle-aged woman with acid reflux. Yeah, imagine yeah. I'm talking to you. I'm yeah, her. Yeah. There's a big window there. Yep. I mean, mirror. Yep. Does she is she thinking all the time? There's someone behind that, or was the illusion kept the whole time? 
Because I reckon they wouldn't have. No, otherwise, what's the point? I There's, think I, saw, I, thought, I might have had to say there might be people. Oh, did you? Observing, but don't, you know, don't worry about it. Just talk to me. Look into my eyes. Yeah. Come around yeah. the eyes. Yeah. Were you a okay. good interviewer or bad interviewer? Like you get good cop and bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was, I was Tell very... us about the acid reflux. <laughs> no, honestly, acid reflux is totally normal. Don't worry about it. You can tell me about it. You're a it. sick puppy and you're going to burn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I was not a very good interviewer. Right. And the weird thing was, it was just two of us working on the case, me and my boss. And um, <laughs> after the fourth day of questioning sessions, we came down to breakfast at the sort of like premier room we were staying, whatever, and we both had acid reflux. No. We talked, we talked ourselves into having it. That's wow. really interesting. Yeah. And then it turns out there was another window mirror <laughs> that he's watching you. There's a bigger conspiracy. And then another out. interviewer comes in and interviews yeah. you, yeah. and yeah. they yeah. get it. And it, wow! I yeah. once once in a focus group with, <clears throat> with the with the window thing, but we knew that there were people because right. you just know, um, yeah. like, right. oh well, right. someone's got to watch. It's just so you don't get distracted. But we yeah. had to play video games and give feedback on on uh, on the oh, video nice. games. I think it was Little Big Planet. Yeah, and I said there should be more interrogation. <laughs> uh, I was wondering what happens if you confess, but the police officer you confess to is a Catholic, because obviously they can't pass on what confessions. They, but it doesn't really. No, it, no. You mean the, if they're a priest? <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. So if you, but like it's a priest cop. That's oh, the I that's see. the pitch of the TV series. He's a priest by day. He's a cop by night. You know. Ooh. But the priest is not allowed to tell anyone what's been confessed, right? Right. Because although when I was at school and I used to go to confession, we had good priest, bad priest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the bad priest used to rat on you all the time. Oh, man. Yeah. 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 Also, there's that one way mirror in the confession booth, <laughs> yeah. which technically they they're not spook, telling. Spooky images in Catholic churches. They, you know. Yeah. yeah. The skeleton they just would work great. Like yeah. the crucifix from the top and the bottom. Glowing <laughs> <laughs> red eyes. Yeah. But this is the weird thing. So. I think in I think the rule in confession so, so in confession booths the rule is that the priest can't disclose anything to anyone. That's but, how I understand it. Yeah. yeah, but there is some leeway. I think if there's so like if Dan, I'm the priest, right? Dan comes into the booth and he says, "I am going to kill James." Oh, yeah. In fact, number two in the next <laughs> yeah. episode of No Such Thing as a Fish. Right. I think I am allowed as the priest. I think some schools of thought say I am allowed to go to the police and say. You might want to check on James. Check he's all right. Yeah, I think yeah, there might yeah. be a threat to him at some point. Uh -huh. But I'm not allowed to say Dan is going to kill him. Yeah. 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 That's Same with psychiatry, right? When you admit, you know... Planning to murder planning someone. Planning to murder James. <laughs> 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 It took like me a long time to get that out in the sessions, but it's, it's a good therapist. It's a real breakthrough. Yeah. <laughs> Just kill him. It's not everything. What are you waiting for? But they're allowed to pass on active threats, aren't they? They must be able to. Don't I mean, know. there must be vanishingly few cases of people in confession booths or, or therapy sessions saying, look, this is the time and place I'm going to commit the moider. <laughs> I don't think it's, I don't think it happens much. I like yeah. that you tried to make it a lighter thing by calling it moida. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has gone a bit dark. Let's say moida. <laughs> Fun cop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, music is often used in interrogation tactics. Yeah. That's a big thing. Metal music, particularly, we've heard about that. Uh, oh, and like Guantanamo. And yeah, stuff. and John mm. Ronson wrote about the fact that like Barney music would be played. That Barney oh. the purple dinosaur. I love you. You love that song. Oh. Over and over to to make mm. people go insane. Did they ever play the blobby Christmas number one? <laughs> I, I bet they have. I bet they have. It's seen as torture. But um, one band that gets used a lot is Metallica, and Metallica hate it because you know it's, any musician would have this opinion. It's that music and politics, music and in you know uh, interrogation and questionable torture shouldn't mm. be mixed. I wouldn't say all musicians think that, but. Well, Many of I, yeah, I imagine most of them. I think there would. is a band in the States, a Christian rock band, that were like, "You can use our music." Demon Hunters, I think. They're Demon called. Hunters. Oh, yeah. It's not. Oh, it's not. Bloody quite, hell. Yeah. <laughs> so Metallica asked for their music not to be used, sure. which it wasn't. There, there was an interview with the guy who has claimed that he killed Osama bin Laden. I don't know if that ever was confirmed. The Seal Six team, and mm. he said that Metallica reached out to them and said, "Can you not use our music?" And Demon Hunter, he claimed, then got piped up and said, "You can have our music. It's fine." And here's some patches demon hunter came out and said actually that's not the case we didn't know what it was ah. being used for they just said they like playing our music they made their own patches so supposedly a demon what, uh, sorry, patches like, an, like, like an like an iron-on patch for your like an iron-on patch for your so uniform on patch. They all, really? Yeah, military would like to wear lots of different patches. But like, they're like the scouts. <laughs> got my, this one I got for killing Osama Bin Laden. You've earned your killing Osama Bin Laden badge. Ah, oh, woof. Yeah, what a dark dog you have to say that is. 
um, one of the most feared uh, Nazi interrogators was a guy called Hans Schaff in the Second World War. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he was not, he wasn't a soldier. He was a Polish born, I think he was a farmer. He lived in South Africa, but he was fluent in English. And if you were an air pilot or air crew and you were caught, you would go to this little town near Frankfurt and you would be put up in you know, reasonably nice digs and they'd just talk to you for a couple of weeks. And Hans Schaff was the one leading these efforts. And they would present you with this incredible dossier. They'd say, well, here are all your unit members' names. Here's your home base. Here's the commander's dog's name. Here's the pub that you guys all drink in. And they just they would present you tiny fragments of information that made you think they knew absolutely everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Which meant you were likely to talk and give away secrets of, you know, Makes which what, the weaknesses of your planes or, or whatever it might be. But the, the, su- the incredibly weird thing is that Hans Schaaf, after the Second World War, he went to work at Disneyland. Oh, oh wow. He became a mosaic artist. And he did um, Cinderella's Castle at Disney, or Whoa. Disney World, I think, in Florida. Yeah. Is that, right? that is, wow. do you know what, though? If I worked in Nazi interrogation, <laughs> the, I want to go off and then work at a magical wonderland <laughs> <Yeah>. and <laughs> do art. Like, you've earned that. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. I just imagine the interview where they want to find a mosaic maker. And they're like, well, what did you do in your previous job? <laughs> yeah. Well, I would be the one who asked the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that in real life, the author of Charlotte's Web became the foster parent to the spider children he based Charlotte on. Okay. So, spider, spider dad. dad children. Spider dad, yeah. yeah. By spider so, children, you mean the children of a spider and not they half were. spider, half giant. <laughs> That's right. So, E.B. White, author of Charlotte's Web, who also penned the classic Stuart Little mm. and quite a few bigger adult books as well, uh, The Elements of Style and um, mm. Is Sex Necessary, which he wrote with James Thurber. These were huge books back in the mm. day. He loved animals, and Charlotte of Charlotte's Web is based on a real spider that he'd seen. He'd spotted it one autumn in 1949, and he came back later and the spider was gone. And the sack of the eggs mm. was still sitting in the web. And he thought, okay, I'm going to collect that. So he took it down and he put it into a box. And he goes to New York and he travels with this. And he has it in his office. And the eggs survived. And, and they came out, these spiders, and started crawling over his office. And they even had their webs shoot up. And he saw them flying across the office. Mm. And he thought, this is great. I'm just going to let them do what they do. And right. so for weeks, they just made home on his desk, in his office. It was his flat, I think. It was his... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, in New York. And, and yeah. it wasn't until his cleaner came along who just went, I'm sorry, I can't clean everything but the spiders that are infesting mm. this room um, that actually then they were murdered what why did she not walk around <laughs> I don't like, know I guess my cleaner doesn't kill my cat every time she comes around she could walk around the you spiders you don't have hundreds of cats the size, <laughs> each the size of a tiny eyelash you know? I don't know it feels like she could work around the spiders <laughs> yeah you'd think so yeah. but he, she she complained he said fine you can uh, you can kill them and just don't and so have a cleaner did. jeez I don't have a cleaner that's how you not get your spider children yeah. murdered <laughs> doing your own <laughs> cleaning yeah yeah. yeah. So yeah, but it's quite nice to know that he never knew the fate of Charlotte, the spider itself. I believe the I species have just died. Exactly, the species them. once they <laughs> lay eggs. Yeah, they um, only live for a year, don't they? It's, if it's a barn spider. Yeah, I think is there so. a spider called a barn spider? That's what that was, I think. Was it? Uh, uh, it's got a scientific name. I didn't see. Oh, it. Yeah. I don't know, but yeah. I didn't even know there was a common name of a barn spider. I've heard of the house spider though. So the spiders called Charlotte. Cavatica? Yeah. And is Cavatica maybe the scientific name? It is. So Charlotte A. Cavatica. And Ah. the A is a shortened scientific word. Uh, Uranus, I think. Right. Uranus Cavatica. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Uranus (laughs) Cavatica. All right. Cool. Sorry, just a quick recap of the Charlotte's web. So there's a pig and a spider. Yeah. Yeah. And the spider saves the pig's life by spinning words into the web. Yeah. Um, someone's going to kill the pig. Uh, like the farmer's going to kill the pig. The farmer's going to kill the big, uh, pig right at the beginning of the book, right. I think. And then, yeah, and Charlotte and the pig have an unlikely friendship. Mm. It is weird that as a farmer, you would see the words written in the web and think, oh, this pig is incredible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No one's like, oh, I'm pretty sure a spider's behind this. <laughs> wow, this pig makes such good webs. <laughs> Wow. So his, I, I actually didn't write down his full first two names. E. B. Um, Elwin Brooks. Elwin Brooks. I think yeah. Yeah. So E. B. is Elwin Brooks, um, but actually went by the name Andy 
his whole life. Did he? Yeah. And it's a really odd reason. He went to Cornell University, and there's a tradition at Cornell, which is if you happen to have shared the surname of the person who was the co-founder and the first president of Cornell, who was a guy called Andrew Dixon White, then you had to just be called Andy because he was <laughs> mm. called Andy. So they shared what? the surname White. And, and so he got given that at Cornell and then the rest of his life, that's what, it, it's what his wife so called him, it's weird. what his friends, it's what his colleagues. I wonder if that still happens at Cornell, if you had the surname White, mm. that you get nicknamed Andy. Get yeah. called E.B. <laughs> Elwin. <laughs> you know there was a real pig as well as a real spider? Is mm. there? Yeah. So he, um, it's a lot of it's really drawn from life because he he lived in uh, Maine on a lovely farm and he just, as Dan said, he connected with nature a lot and he almost preferred his farm to well, he definitely preferred his farm to city life. Um, but he kept a pig and in 1948, so three or four years before writing Charlotte's Web. Uh, he wrote the essay Death of a Pig, which was all about a pig he'd been planning to slaughter, which then got very ill. And um, the pig had erysipelas, which is a skin, <laughs> no skin condition. Uh, erysipelas? Yeah. Eris it's a skin condition Dan famously couldn't pronounce a few years ago on this podcast. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. And it's dangerous because it can transfer to people as well. Friend of the podcast, <laughs> erysipelas. <laughs> That's so weird. Yeah. And, and he wrote, I discovered that once one has given a pig an enema, there is no turning back. The pig's lot and mine were inextricably bound now. Oh. So he had to give the pig a medical enema at one point or another. Right. And it really brought them closer together. Sure. I love I, I, everything I've read about E.B. White. I love. He just yeah. seems such a dork. He would have been perfect, I think, on this podcast. Like, here's a here's an example of how dorky he was. Mm -hmm. um, so he fell uh, in love with this girl uh, called Catherine Sargent Angle, who was a fiction editor who worked at uh, the New Yorker, uh, and that's he was a writer for the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. and so she that's was how married at the time. Yeah, that's Ooh. right. Yeah, and they they eloped, and <gasps> uh, they had uh, you know they had their marriage, and then he said later on, I soon realized. I'd made no mistake in my choice of wife. I was helping her pack an overnight bag one afternoon when she said, put in some tooth twine. I knew then that a girl who called dental floss tooth twine was the girl for me. Oh, yeah. that's so sweet. <laughs> Well, I uh, I quite enjoyed uh, finding out that when someone asked him why he wrote Charlotte's Web, he mm. said, uh, I haven't told why I wrote the book, but I haven't told you why I sneeze either. And a book is a sneeze. <laughs> that is his, uh, yeah. And so he doesn't know why. He inside wrote it. you, and you just have to, you have a story inside you, and you have to share it with the world. Yeah, I guess so. And it leaves your body at 17 miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you keep your eyes open when you're writing the book, <laughs> they will pop out. <laughs> um, did you see that letter that a little girl wrote to him asking him why? It was nine years after Charlotte's Web had come out, and she said, When's the next book coming out? And he replied, I would like to write another book for children, but I spend all my spare time just answering letters I get from children. <laughs> about the books I have already written. <laughs> so it looks like a hopeless situation unless you can start a movement in America called Don't Write to E.B. White Until He Produces Another Book. <laughs> wow. wow. That's harsh, that, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that I is pretty harsh. But that is like the... That is exactly the sort of reply that I end up start doing on Twitter, like, <laughs> like with the reply guys and stuff. I'm like, yeah. oh, I'm just running out of patience now. Do you reply to reply guys? I used to. Really? <laughs> don't don't bother now. No, no, no. <laughs> no. I've but never yeah. heard that term. Is that just people who reply no matter what? Well, no, it's a, it's it's quite a sex specific thing, isn't it? Oh. Yeah. Well, generally, generally, reply guys tend to be dudes who reply to women to, and in, in my case, uh, explain our own jokes to us or why they uh. might be better somehow okay, with right. an addition of something often incorrect so do, you do it all the time i do it all the time yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, you, have you thought of trying harder yeah. <laughs> um he had a really interesting process for writing eb white you so he could never listen to music because that would be it would get his attention diverted and that and that's i think quite famous for any writer anything with lyrics just, uh, get that away but what he did used to do was sit in the bit of his house that had the most traffic in it. So his wife passing through, his kids passing through, oh, whoever right. was in the house. Yeah. yeah, not like cars and stuff. No, exactly. <laughs> but like just foot, yeah, foot traffic uh, <laughs> from his family. I think that's crazy. I agree. Yeah. I think that's yeah. really difficult to concentrate when there's so much happening. But yeah, it's bad, I, that, isn't that it? must be one of the most unusual writing methods mm. anyone's any writer's ever had. Yeah, yeah. to kind actively like, is it like Dan Brown hangs upside down or something to write. That even. sounds like a Doctor Zeus book. <laughs> Dan Brown hangs upside down. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, he would do that if he had, if he just needed thinking time, yeah, he yeah. would hang upside down. I don't think he physically wrote while he was Because <laughs> the down. pen just wouldn't work after Exactly, well, he might have lines. a space pen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm. one of those anti-gravity or a pencil. You know uh, Stuart Little? Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. What is, what is he, though? Oh, best friend. A mouse. Right. R- mm. And when I say right, I mean wrong. <laughs> oh. He's not a mouse. He's not is, even a mouse. Is he a dar mouse? A no. rat? No, he's, so, he's. He's a child who, very looks, small who looks like a mouse. What? Oh, right. Really? It's very weird. No. In the book. Really? Yeah. In the book, it's described as... Because he's, he's given birth to by his human parents. And they say... And the book says he's the size of a mouse. Oh, I and see. And he, he, he has all the characteristics of a mouse. But he is... He, He's quite indeterminate as species-wise. Interesting. So in the book, it's not illustrated, is it? Or is it? I don't know, don't know if the original edition was yeah, illustrated. Because in Charlotte's Web, the illustrator wanted to give the spider human-woman facial features. Terrifying. Yeah. And uh, and they were like, no, no, it should just look like a spider. And yeah. so it was just a spider. But in the animated film, she was given... Like her face. Oh, given, she's got a lady face. Maybe that's why, because he, he hated the movie, didn't he? Did he? Yeah, he saw it. And I guess like a lot of children's authors, like P.L. Travers seeing Mary Poppins, mm-hmm. the movie, hate the way that their work is translated. Um, but he hated Charlotte's Web. Um, that might right. be the reason. But this kind of makes sense that maybe Stuart Little wasn't a mouse because he did have a bit of a bugbear about when people made animals a bit more human-like rather than like Charlotte's Web. It was a pig and it was a spider, mm. whereas he can never understand Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. He's like, why are they, why are they driving a car? What the hell's going on there? You, <laughs> oh, like, yeah. the, the mouse, a mouse doesn't drive a car. Because I haven't read this book. Is his spider quite realistic? Like barn spider, female barn spiders will <laughs> stick some <laughs> like silk out of their bum and then walk around and it's got like pheromones on it and then the males will follow her around. Oh, there's a whole chapter about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's where, the, it's where the spider babies come from. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. But, but he did use a lot of technical terms. He explained like the different bits of the, like the, he was yeah. very, he researched spiders for ages mm. to get all of the understanding. So when you read it, you get an understanding about like, you know, this bit of the leg is called this, this bit of the hand, right. the hand yeah. is called this. <laughs> he, yeah. um, he was incredibly shy as well. E.B. White. Yeah. Mm. He was very, he's a very anxious guy about well, pretty much everything. Um, when, he, when he worked at the New Yorker, he would sometimes go out of the fire escape if someone he didn't know turned up at the office. Oh. He'd just pop out, you know, of the window, effectively. <laughs> wow. Um, he skipped. What, any time it was someone he didn't know at the office or someone who just, was coming to talk to him? I think probably someone coming to talk to him. It's a big office, isn't yeah, it? Exactly. He wouldn't have got anything done. Yeah, you're right. Um, because skipped, to when... me, it just sounds like someone who's smoking and trying to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he skipped parties. He skipped his uh, the burial service of his wife of, of many decades. He skipped the Presidential Medal of Freedom Awards ceremony where JFK mm. was trying to give him a medal. Wow. The National Medal for Literature Award. He skipped that too. He just right. did not yeah. want to go out. He was shy around women, wasn't he? Was yeah. he? Um, yeah, he once said, I have too small a heart and too large a pen. And it feels like he didn't get to the end of that he, sentence. Yes. <laughs> the ink ran out. <laughs> yeah, he, his wife even, when he was communicating sort of love notes and stuff, he would still even hide behind an animal persona. I don't think he was a furry. I think he just didn't <laughs> have... Yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone thinks <laughs> that you, you thought that. It, I think it now. Actually, he wasn't a furry. He was a human with the characteristics of a furry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, this is all, mm. by the way, it's a guy called Michael Sims who wrote this amazing biography on him mm. who discovered that Charlotte was based on a real spider, found out this story about the, mm. the egg sac, and he did an interview on NPR where I was reading this on, and um, he said that when it came to the audiobook, the death scene, so spoiler alert, Charlotte dies in the book, mm. um, he found it impossible to read the death scene out loud and according to the producer it took him 17 takes in order to get it out finally uh he said how many takes did your book take Dad? (laughs) i was just crying the whole way through (laughs) you shouldn't put the word erysipelas in so many times that's the problem (laughs) but he would go out he would go out for walks would try and get himself together to go back in and do it and he would say yeah he was like this is ridiculous a grown man crying over the death of an imaginary insect go back in and then just start crying all over not an insect mate yeah (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah, James is in the booth <laughs> pressing a button. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's when he was crying. You know, the final line is, and then the insect died. <laughs> um. <laughs> it is time for fact number three, and that is Andy. 
My fact is that one of the world's best dance choreographers is called Mr. Millipede. Um, I should say, uh, this was sent in by a listener, so thank you to Maggie Mortensen, who sent it in. Um, Yeah, and uh, Mr. Millipede, I think he's Benjamin? Benjamin? Yes. And now, now, uh, James is looking, he's giving me a look. Millipied is mil, mil pied. It's how he would pronounce it. It's how he would pronounce it, but it's not how I'm pronouncing it. And <laughs> uh, he's not on this podcast, so no. Yeah. But it's it's millipede. Uh, yeah, so it translates a, into French as a thousand feet, right? Yeah. There we go. Um, yeah. I've seen newspaper articles interviewing him who call him the man with a thousand feet. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. That's great. I think because he dances so well, it's almost as if he has a thousand feet. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I think make it a lot harder to dance. Yeah. It would be hard. Yeah, if two uh, left feet, but you've got like what five hundred instead. <laughs> <laughs> and this is just a fact about someone with an amusing name in the world of dance. Mm, yeah, nominative yeah. determinism. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. I went to school with a girl called Erin Trimmer who became a hairdresser. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Shout out to Aaron Trimmer. <laughs> <laughs> so Mr. Millipede uh, is he's quite notable in the world of Hollywood. He has choreographed a lot of movies. He's done June, the first June movie. He did the choreograph for the um, for the giant worm dance. The giant the millipede. Co- yeah, the big <laughs> millipede that comes out. There's a dance in there, I believe. I haven't seen the movie yeah, myself. I, oh, yes, there's, oh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a dance. There's a, a cool shifting dance over the sand. We sashay to avoid attracting the attention of the big old worms that live oh, in the desert. because right. they feel the vibrations of your feet they sense it? movement for, ah. they're, and they're very incredibly sensitive to it but if you walk in a particular way then cool. they won't spot you is it a dance or is it just someone walking well it's a gate yeah. you know a gate yeah okay. see, when, i've not seen june but i imagined that it was like a bit in the movie where they're like and now we do the worm dance <laughs> and then like everybody joins in and they're like it's just a step to the left and, yeah basically it's I'm imagining yeah uh, Mr. Millipede you know, comes walk. running out in, in leotards it's like a Jane <laughs> yeah. Fonda video yeah um, but he also did Black Swan uh, mm. which was the ballet movie and it was on that movie that he met his future wife Natalie Portman so mm. yeah Mr. Millipede is married to Natalie Portman just yeah. some hot goss <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yeah. They split up though because he's got together with one of the worms from Dune. It's very, it's still very sad. Um, yeah. Um, but no, uh, just uh, ballet. Unless anyone's got anything more on, on Benny Mill. He's, um, Mr. Millipede has got a <laughs> tattoo on his abdomen oh, yeah. of a Bauhaus symbol, which oh. I think is quite cool. You know the German yeah, the architecture, architecture thing. Right. Uh, it's a it's like a profile of a face uh, designed by a painter called Oscar Schlemmer, and Oscar Schlemmer is really cool. He was he had five of his artworks in the Nazi organized degenerative art exhibition in mm. Munich. Do you know about that? So no. they piled up a load of art. They sort of, well, basically, yeah. they the Nazis decided, and um, Hitler especially, because he was a, he thought of himself as an artist. They got a load of like German artworks that showed the greatness of Germany and put them all in an amazing museum. And then down the road, they got all the stuff that they really hated and said, "This is all degenerate." This, oh, you know, right. and I mean, which one would you rather see? Yeah, like <laughs> it's so, I would so much Trudging, rather. Trudging front to yet another Hitler watercolor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah, Schlemmer wow. had a load of stuff there. And then they had loads of rooms. Like a lot of them were quite anti-Semitic, the names of the rooms and stuff. But um, right. they had some that was like an insult to German womanhood. And then they'd have a load of paintings that were insulting German women. Right. And then madness <laughs> becomes method and nature as seen by sick minds. Wow. Oh, yeah, these do sound quite cool. Like, they quite sound cool. amazing. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Don't they? Mm. Very nice. Anyway, that's just a thing about Bauhaus. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the movie Black Swan, just very quickly oh, yeah. while we're still on Millipede, it, there was a lot of controversy about the movie when Natalie Portman won the Oscar for it because, really? well, there's a lot of scenes which is to do with really intensive, amazing ballet dancing. And there was a stunt double. Natalie Portman was good at ballet, but she'd only done it for a year. She wasn't at the level that you needed to be mm. in order to pull those moves. Um, but the person who played the stunt double didn't get any of the credit. And there was a lot of questions about whether oh. or not best actor should be going to someone who is not necessarily I can acting see a lot of the, but I mean, yeah. there's a lot of emotional scenes in there mm, and sure. you know so there's a lot of acting that goes on so it's justified it should be a joint thing yeah like if hmm. you win best actor for a particular role then anyone else in the film 
that had to play, whether it's a stunt double yeah. or a stand-in or something. Yes. They should all like, get on stage. They but, share it. But if it's someone doing the back of your head for a day where you were busy yeah. shooting a different yeah. sequence, like, but they in. can come on stage, but they have to show only the back <laughs> yeah. of their head. Yeah, 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 the yeah, Oscar yeah. statuette yeah. is only the back of the Oscar's head <laughs> as well. Yeah. And, and they all have to dress in whatever the, the actor <laughs> yeah. is wearing. They're all wearing the same outfit. Oh, so we yeah. change it from the nominations being the actor's names to the character name of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Therefore, you can have multiple people. Best character is a really good category. I yeah. really like that. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, then it's not as problematic when people eventually do something that makes you go, oh, oh, I don't like yeah. them anymore. Yeah. yeah. Be like, oh, I still like that character. Yeah. yeah that's I love true. it. Interestingly, last thing on Black Swan, Black Swan was made by Darren Ar- Aronofsky, the director, and he also made The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke. Mm. And initially, Black Swan and The Wrestler were meant to be one movie where a ballet dancer fell in love with The Wrestler. And that was Whoa. the initial movie. It was meant to be one cinematic universe ah, combination and then he what? just split it into two movies <laughs> that's a brilliant what, <laughs> what? Oh, I would have loved to watch it would Mr. Millipede also choreograph the wrestling <laughs> yeah. yeah the wrestling was pro ballet is fake <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's a thing called beat deafness have you heard of this no it's like no, I think um, I've got it yeah do you think no I'm sure you don't it's like tone deafness only you can't dance it's quite rare. But dancing well is subjective, Very, isn't it? Really? Yeah. yeah, it is. It is. I'm more talking about being in rhythm. So they'd walk, mm. they'd watch Strictly come dancing, for example, and be like, "Wow, why are they not in time to the band?" It's that. Yeah. Kind of well, thing. they would just. It would be completely alien to them. It would right. be. They wouldn't think they're out of time or they're in time. They would just be like, "Well, I don't know what's going on here. Mm-hmm. He's just moving his arms and there's music playing, but I can't put the two together." Right. Okay. I wonder if anyone famous has that hmm. I mean I definitely can't keep to time I found okay. that out by trying to learn the drums oh, and yeah. after many lessons uh, and a very patient teacher <laughs> oh. realized I just can't keep to time I always get faster oh, always all the time oh. and I, the thing is I love like I love dancing and stuff I did dance in high school I saw a video and I am clearly half a beat behind everyone else <laughs> like wow. it's yeah yeah How I've just had to what kind of dancing was it uh, <laughs> um I did uh, interpretive because uh, it's a lot harder to prove wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's the best. There, there are some dances that it's clear if you're a beat behind. But if you do the right. yonky cokey and your arms in when everyone else is out, <laughs> yeah. that's really obvious. Well, because you'd have to do like group ones as well. And that that was more like modern dance or right. whatever. Yeah, so that one was one I was always out. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to see just videos of that where someone doesn't know. <laughs> Hi, yeah, so we're actually on knees, not shoulders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't you do a bit of dance? Me? No? Yeah, you. Where? Well, I'm thinking of your school because you went to a very interesting school. Oh, yeah, yeah. We went to you a did... Rudolf Steiner school. We did Eurythmy, which is a, ah, a dance invented yeah, yeah, yeah. by Rudolf Steiner. Yeah. Um, so you used to go, it was, you know, it's very kind to call it a dance. What it is is you just get given a pole and you have to walk forwards and backwards, just moving the pole from vertical but to a, horizontal. A metal pole? Yeah. You'd be a... disappointed if you go to see a pole dancer and that's... <laughs> <laughs> It's Dan telling you about the Yeti while he walks back and forwards. Um, ballet moves. Oh, yeah. Did you know one of the most iconic sports logos of all time is a ballet move? Okay, we're going to have to guess Yeah, it. try okay. and guess is it. The oh, Michael oh, I Jordan think I know what, song? yeah. There is we it? go. Yeah. Michael oh. Jordan, the famous... Oh, well, can we keep guessing? I mean, I feel like I didn't <laughs> oh, yeah, get to sorry. guess. No, 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 sorry, The sorry. Nike swoosh. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, go for it, go for it. I was thinking the Olympic rings. Yeah, no, close, close. <laughs> Do you want it one more? No, no. Oh, okay. No. Yeah, so James is actually, as I said earlier, correct. Oh, wow. Um, the very iconic Michael Jordan looking like he's going for a dunk. So his arms are yeah. out, he's got a ball <laughs> in his hand, legs are wide. It's not going for phrase? a dunk. Going for a dunk? Yeah, you go for a dunk. <laughs> he's dunking. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, so I'm going for a dunk. <laughs> just going for a dunk. <laughs> Nothing Give it but a few nets. minutes. I've just been for a dunk. <laughs> uh, I had to bounce off the backboard. <laughs> Um, that's everyone assumes that that's him dunking it's not he's in a photo shoot that he was doing with a guy called Peter Moore um, he did a ballet leap and that was caught in the photo oh. and they thought that just looked so perfect a stance uh, for this logo oh, yeah. did he know it. it was a ballet leap yeah I believe so yeah I, there's not there's not too much information on it it's just from this guy Peter Moore who pointed out that when the photos were taken that's what was happening so we know that it was specifically that um, so Amazing. yeah Whoa. ballet in Michael Jordan land. I think, I might be wrong about it. No, I, I'm right about this. When my parents used to ask me what I wanted to be when I grow up, 
until I was about seven or eight, I said I wanted to be a ballet dancer. Wow. Ah, oh, legend. And then you, I discovered football. Oh, so. you get to go on I my meant- list of uh, famous people, calling you famous, James. <laughs> famous people who started off as uh, ballerinas or... A I wouldn't say ballet. I started off as a ballerina. Um, other people on the list? Tupac? Tupac? Oh, yeah. The I mean, rapper Tupac. He, I did it with him. There actually. you go. <laughs> there you go. High school in Bolton. Yeah, Tupac was um he he was the mouse king in the school play The Nutcracker, but he actually studied. In- interesting fact about the mouse king. Yeah. Not a mouse. Yeah. 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 It just has the dimensions of a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, also on the list, the Daleks from Doctor Who. Bit of a stretch. No, not really. They the <laughs> so Terry Nation when he was designing the Daleks, yeah. he, he was inspired by the Soviet dance troupe, uh, the Georgian State Ballet, when they were performing <laughs> in London, and believed that that would be a perfect. Like he got looked at it and went, "Wow, the way oh. they glided." He thought a Dalek would be That's a really perfect cool. way of doing that. Um, and so not only was that the inspiration, but the very first people who sat inside the Daleks oh. were dancers really? to help with the wow. with the movement because they understood oh. how to yeah use oh. their feet oh. better and that's than why most. You never see ballet dancers going upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. incapable of going upstairs i think louis the who's the sun king the louis the 14th, 14th. Yeah. yeah he was into ballet and that's how he got oh. called the sun king it's named after a character in a in a ballet i don't know which oh. one yeah he was massive into it mm. he used to like try and do the dances himself at like yeah. dinners and stuff wow. yeah yeah so what Truly. were they called because i was reading that ballerina is the word that you would use for a female ballet person it would be italian what? wouldn't it so what, what's the word? We don't have an English word for a male... Ballerino. Ballerino. <laughs> Probably. That's a Ballerinos, good word. Yeah. you know. Ballerinos. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Ballerino. I thought I'd take us down a different uh, lane note looking at ballet today. Oh, yeah. um, and this was uh, quite recent. The director of a leading German ballet company had to be investigated by police because uh, he smeared a critic's face with feces, with dog feces. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> because she'd uh, said too many bad things about... Um, his ballets. Yes, this is a terrible story. Yeah, it's a bit. <laughs> it was a. It was a, like just a drive by. It was a drive by. Well, no, 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 but it, you know. <laughs> it takes some skill, doesn't it? <laughs> just going for a dunk. But it's <laughs> <laughs> like it's oh, ve- that. So it's very high passion. It was a critic. What? The critic had written a, a, a very, very hostile reviews of yeah. the of the, this particular ballet's it, ballet company. It was a company. previous show, I think. Yeah, yeah. In, in the Dutch Mountains, it was called, uh, which had been performed earlier. Okay. Furious with the review that was given, and they were putting on this new performance. What's interesting is I don't think he knew that she was going to be there on that night. He just happened to have the dog poo in his no, pocket, which makes it on. more interesting if that's the case. Come on, no, it can't be true. You know, if did he, he always have a dog with him? Maybe. Like, and well, it was just... his dog's poo, so uh, yeah. I wonder if maybe he happened to have his dog with him at the yeah. time. God, crikey! Yeah, mm. I won't lie. There's some there's some reviewers who I think were probably. <laughs> wow. <Uh-oh. laughs> this Let's is name cons- names. We'll bleep them out. No, no, yeah. it's a confessional space. You can say what you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if if I think there is a risk to them, I will have to. Well, yeah. Um. One of the so the big. I mean, it was a huge. Um, I guess you'd say a sort of soft power thing for lots of, I mean, lots of very big Eastern European ballet companies, especially Russian. So the Bolshoi Ballet is a mm. very, very, very famous Russian ballet. This is interesting. Uh, again, it's people who you wouldn't think would were ballerinas, uh, but but were. So have you seen Die Hard? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. yes. I, yeah. So I know about this. Yeah. This is um, one of the henchmen in Die Hard. Mm-hmm. It's Carl. The, okay. The big blonde guy. Gets yeah. shot. No, it's he's, his brother that gets shot. Exactly, mm. exactly. Right. He won best character in 1980. I can't believe <laughs> yeah, you don't yeah, remember yeah. this. Well, um, 16 people except the. <laughs> what? And, uh, Carl, Carl, the huge blonde henchman who's extremely tough. He yeah. uh, he was a former principal lead dancer in the Bolshoi Ballet. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, because ex- I've been to see a Bolshoi in Moscow, mm. and the guys who do it, they're quite slim, but they're strong. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have to be so strong. It takes to a lot do of that. strength. Yeah, yeah. And it also takes a lot of strength to defect. Which is what um, is that what he did? Alexander Godunov did. Yeah, he was on tour in the USA. Big, there's a big thing of ballet defections. Nuri, Ru, is it Nuriev, Rudolf Nuriev? Nishnikov, was yeah. it the other guy? Rudolf Nuriev defected at the airport. He was about to go back to the Soviet Union. He had his handlers from the KGB with him, and he 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 fled to the French police who were who were there at the airport. Wow! But he didn't do it. Like I don't think he did a cool move. At, like a which police. Is, yeah, 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 I, 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 I wish he had a Jordan <laughs> leap. <laughs> yeah. 
stop the podcast. Hi everyone, I alone am here to tell you or to remind you about Club Fish. Club Fish is the place to go if you do not have enough no such thing as a fish in your life. It's a place where you get bonus episodes. We do shows where we chat about our mailbox. We do Meet the Elf where you'll meet some younger members of the QI team who will try to stump us with their fiendish questions. Uh, We'll have compilations on there. In fact, the last one that we posted a couple of weeks ago had clips from before Anna left. So if you forgot what she sounds like, you can go and listen to that. Clubfish is also the place to go if you want to get ad-free episodes. It's also the place to go if you want to hear about our live shows first. And there'll be all sorts of other things on there. For instance, this week, you will hear in the next 10 minutes, we're going to give away an object and it will be given to a Clubfish member. If you want to join Clubfish, then the places to go are no such thing as a fish.com slash apple and no such thing as a fish.com forward slash Patreon. I know for a fact if if you join up through Apple, you do get a short amount of time for free. So you could theoretically maybe see if you like it or you could just binge all of our bonus content and then unsubscribe. We wouldn't think any less of you for doing it. Anyway, that's enough pushing Clubfish. We know that a lot of you are here just for the free stuff and that is absolutely fine too. So we have one fact left. It is my fact. Hope you enjoy it. On with the podcast. <laughs> Okay, it is time for our final fact of the show. That is James. Okay, my fact this week is that in 1997, Mattel recalled one of its Cabbage Patch dolls because it had started eating children. <laughs> <laughs> I remember this. Do you? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh my wow. god. Yeah, because I was a bit. I was really into Cabbage Patch Kids. Were and, you? And um, and I remember that that was going that particular toy was going to be released in Australia and then when they got recalled in the States they never made it to Australia how interesting I'd never heard of it before but yeah I mean it's incredible and when I say eating children Mm. it was only bits of children it was eating couldn't manage a whole one (laughs) it was a toy which had a mouth which you could feed food into Mm. and it had a rucksack at the back Mm. and then you would feed them a a cookie or something and it would go through the body and then it would mysteriously arrive in the rucksack Mm. and and that would be the the game genius um but children started putting their fingers into the mouths or the hair or whatever and there was really no way to stop it i don't think kids were deliberately putting their hair in them i think the hair was getting caught the hair was getting caught i can imagine them putting their fingers in deliberately someone with a one-year-old child that Mm. you know that might happen but anyway once you put any part of your body into this mouth you couldn't get it out because wow. these because behind the lips of the doll are these two these metal rollers, rollers right yeah. and they only and rolled one way exactly <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah yeah and they had um about a hundred incidents reported uh in this christmas time it started off just a few and then suddenly like more and more and more people started saying yeah my kids are being eaten by this doll I, and I, I, just legally I, I i did find a claim by mattel that these are all isolated incidents but that really raised a question of how many incidents do they have to be for f- the stop the, being isolated? There were about yes. hundred isolated incidents. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 But, I mean, they did sell many, many, um, prob- at least hundreds of thousands of. They sold a lot of them, and so it's a very Still. low percentage of children who got eaten oh, sure. by these dolls. <laughs> One is too many, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it rather feels that way. Yeah. Oh dear. Uh, but yeah, cabbage patch kids. They're incredible. With these dolls, there's there's an extraordinary thing that I never appreciated about cabbage patch dolls, which is basically they're handmade to be. In each they one were, is yeah. very different yeah. from like it, not even the model there's obviously different models but within the models each one has differences in it because they are basically they're all supposed to be kind of unique I yeah think. like for instance i got oh. one yes oh it's still in the box well i only bought it yesterday oh <laughs> this is not one that eats children this is just a normal cabbage patch doll there wow wow uh, and as you can see mine is called leona jade oh you've gone is it a ballerina uh, yeah, it has, <laughs> yeah she has like a little birth certificate and adoption papers and the yeah. idea is that they're all unique pretty much and and that was different as well wasn't it that you didn't buy it you didn't buy a doll you adopted a doll you exactly got the birth certificate. Oh, yeah, you got yeah. oh i've yeah. got them i've have got the got... birth certificates and everything yeah yeah i had one called alice who had um came with hair like products so you could style the hair it came with a little thing of hairspray oh. so you could uh, do its hair and i wasn't a doll kid like right. i would i didn't like barbies or anything like that i was more into trolls but mm. but the cabbage patch kid there was just something 
about it. Did you do you know about the cute schema? No. The schema of cuteness. Um, so there was a study done um, by a university in uh, in Japan. Of course, they would study cuteness, <laughs> and it was to look at the things that we respond to as humans to decide that something is cute. Mm. So the mm. um, the forehead is normally quite large, big eyes, the eyes usually quite low on the forehead, uh, and um, sort of chunky, short limbs and things mm. and they believe that the reason that cabbage patch dolls became so popular um and became like because they weren't they didn't do anything not like you know before all of these the yeah, original yeah. ones didn't they didn't do anything right. they didn't eat children <laughs> um they think that the reason they w- went so big is because it violates the cute schema so oh if you look okay. at a cabbage patch doll you'll notice that the eyes are actually quite small quite close yeah. together and so there's elements about them that are considered grotesque oh I, I, but not I fi- enough i find I, I don't i don't i find them a bit creepy and that's oh, why because it divides people and people either think they're cute or creepy oh, and creepy. so people would talk about them because people go oh they're so cute and other people go no no no, they're really creepy yeah and as we know from just the media today if you can cause a divide in public mm. opinion people will talk and debate yeah. and argue yeah and my um, just yeah my wife won't let me take this home I bought it. Oh, really? She really doesn't like is it. Is this new? Is so it like an eBay? It's purchase? brand new. No, I bought it. Oh, so this was in a shop, right? Yeah, yeah. So does anyone want one? Absolutely. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Definitely. Or shall I thought what we could give it away to one of our listeners? Nice, nice idea. Should we no. give it away to someone on Club Fish? Pretty sure I just claimed it, but yeah. Uh, no, okay. of course, of course. Yeah, yeah you Discord. should always yeah. give away adopted children as, as a prize. <laughs> <laughs> it's just be a double adoption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. let's do that. Okay, we'll, I will work out a competition. <laughs> um, the thing about the sort of the look of the freakish look and so on, mm. that led to one of the great myths about Cabbage Patch Kids that circulated in the 80s, which I, and it, reading this kind of makes me miss being a kid again and falling for these amazing legends. Dan, you still fall for these things yeah. <laughs> that's true that's true but um the the story was the reason they looked like that was because president of america at the time ronald reagan gave a directive to the makers of it to show what we would look like following the survival of a nuclear holocaust <laughs> <laughs> and to get us used to the idea that we're going to look quite freakish and it would be normalized by the time it happened we would yeah. sort of accept it as normal humans uh, I mean, being like that and that went around great. for yeah it's such a great story but um it it's you know obviously not true but that's oh, really it, <laughs> remarkably uh it's not true that's so funny i, f- yeah. I find everything about them a bit a bit rum yeah really? do you, what did you guys read about the Babyland General Hospital. Oh, yeah. Was this what it, so well, actually, were, it's go- mentioned on this box. It, it says that um, there was a young boy called Xavier Roberts who discovered a magical cabbage patch uh, and he built Babyland General Hospital where his children now live and play until someone takes them home to care for them and love them. Right. And that sounds like just a bit of corporate guff. Mm. Yeah. And actually, it's a real place. Yeah, and it exists. <laughs> so he, so he, he kind of, well, we'll get on, I'm sure we'll get on to the history of how they were originated. But in 1978, I think he opened up and I think it was a former medical facility. Yeah. He opened up Babyland General Hospital and you could go there as a punter and they held live births mm. at the hospital. And there was a write-up on um, <laughs> Slate. Okay. Every half hour or so, an employee dressed as a doctor or nurse gets on the PA and announces there is a code green. That means that Mother Cabbage is in labour. <laughs> and it's time to head to the magical crystal tree to watch a baby being born. The birthing process lasts under three minutes. Uh-huh. Not realistic. Um, a nurse in scrubs and latex gloves stands among the cabbages and tells the crowd that Mother Cabbage has dilated the full ten leaves apart. <laughs> That's the, such a gag for the parents. I know. Yeah. Like, like really the kids is. have no yeah, yeah. idea. The parents are going to be like, oh, I see what they're saying. Yeah. As, as the crystal, well, there are, more, there are more very specific parent gags. As the crystals at the base of the tree begin to glow, the nurse gives the cabbage a shot of imagicillin and announces she will Brilliant. be performing an esiotomy. Episiotomy gag there, as opposed to a C-section, which stands for cabbage section. The nurse gently spreads the cabbage leaves, reaches in her gloved hands, and slowly pulls out a naked doll. The kids in the crowd murmur, gasp, and applaud. Wow! People say that's creepy. It's, it's yeah. so weird. <laughs> I would love to see that. Would, yeah. But it was the whole yeah. story was one of the reasons. Uh, the other reasons they became so popular because it rather than just being a doll it was this whole you were buying into the mythos yeah Yeah. like you're actually adopting a thing you know the parents would be like oh that's a really cute idea and oh oh my my kid can adopt a doll and stuff and so yeah and it worked 
That's amazing. Yeah. It really did work because they were absolutely massive, weren't yeah. they? They were. <laughs> when they yeah. first went out, when was that going to be in like the 80s? 80s early yeah, 80s, 80s, yeah. Yeah, and there was riots when people were trying to get them <laughs> in shops. And um, I was reading some newspaper articles from the time uh, about these riots that were happening in the, in the States. Um, the Citizen's Voice newspaper, this was in Pennsylvania, one pregnant woman bit another patron and knocked his hat off. <laughs> I think wo- she was just trying to eat a cookie, but then <laughs> <laughs> got caught. Another woman was punched in the face by a female shopper. One woman chased a man through a parking lot, calling him an SOB. Wow. Uh, the Simi Valley star from California said one woman was swinging a baseball bat wildly at other women wow. uh, to get one of these dolls. And it wasn't even the last doll in the shop that she she was getting <laughs> apparently because all these dolls are slightly different from each other she'd seen one that she particularly wanted and she just didn't want anyone else to go near them so wow. she was swinging the baseball bats uh, and in 2008 <laughs> uh, four kids entertainment inc who at the time owned the license for these they released a special edition of the dolls to commemorate the riots Oh wow! Isn't that amazing? That's awesome. what, like a, 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 did it come with riot? No, it was just like yeah. riot gear. Or... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They have, yeah. They've become slightly different over the years. Like this is the one that I've got here is a bit more vinyl and a bit more toy like than yeah. the originals. The ones that they did to commemorate, they were um, more close to the originals. Yeah. basically. you can see. I mean, it's you know since becoming a parent and understanding the Christmas rush to get toys, you can understand why movies like Jingle All the Way are so you know Arnold Schwarzenegger's most relatable film. movie it's that was all about a <laughs> toy have you His not most seen it relatable no. movie absolutely That's now just, I never think of Arnold more oh. than Conan the Barbarian <laughs> yeah yeah even uh, more than Conan more even than more than, even more than Terminator yeah huh. it's more than more than <laughs> Kindergarten Cold <laughs> Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines <laughs> Uh, no, not no, no. <laughs> Sorry. quite quite Sorry. relatable. <laughs> so Xavier Roberts, the person who invented, he's mentioned on the side of the box and correct in your Con- James, controversial. highly controversial. Twenty-one-year-old mm. art student when he first um, notices uh, that there is a German techniquing of needle molding, and he sees a lady called Martha Nelson who is uh, making these doll babies, and he goes, "Oh, that looks really interesting." Mm. She has adoption papers for. For the babies um, she has original names for the babies he goes off changes the technique ever so slightly but it was very much lifted from what this woman was doing and then he kind of went off and ran with it and got all the credit for creating this yeah. new style of doll yeah because basically she made this doll right she was selling them to him because he owned a gift shop uh, and then he wanted to up the price she refused and so refused to give him any more dolls and so he said well i'm just going to make them myself then Basically, mm. that's what happened. And did yeah. he want to mass produce them a bit more? He I did, he yeah. Ha- and then the official them. website says that he was into needle molding mm. and that he learned quilting skills from mm. his mother and all that kind of stuff. But it seems very much it that does, he, you know. Yeah. So what we're saying is that the side of the box here, where it says that <laughs> the bunny bees, we're saying they're not involved at all. No, I think one really weird thing about this this doll, I mean, there's a lot of weird things about this doll, but supposedly there's a guy called Xavier and he runs a hospital that looks after these cabbage babies until they're adopted. That's the guy we're talking about, Xavier Roberts, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you look at any of these things, he's signed all the buttocks. James is just showing us the doll's butt. If you look at the bum of the doll, yeah. his yeah. signature is on the bum. Really? What? And it... I think that's kind of a weird oh, wow. thing for someone running a hospital to do to their babies. Well, it's you? like those surgeons, isn't it? Sometimes you know those surgeons. Sometimes they get in trouble because there are a few surgeons who got in trouble for burning their yeah. initials <gasps> on a patient's liver. Yeah. You know, mid-operation, oh. and then it turns out you've just you know, and it's a kind of. I guess it's a fun joke. Oh, yeah. But that's effectively what Xavier appears to have done on all these toys. Well, maybe he signed He's... them with pen and they went off and got it tattooed afterwards. Oh, like, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Could have yeah. been their own decision, you're right. In 2020, um, bringing in trolls, my favourites. <laughs> yeah. There was one, uh, it was called the Poppy and Sing doll, I think. And basically she had a little button on her tummy that you would press it and she'd be like, Ray, let's do a song or something. Um, but she also had a button underneath her so that when she sat down, she would say other things. But that, that happened to be right, right in the crotch, like right, <laughs> right in the gusset um, <laughs> was where that button was located. And most of the sounds that she made when you press that were, 
were gasping. <laughs> I heard going, oh, and oh my wee, God. yeah, oh, like God. it's just sound effects. So there was a um, there was a petition to recall it by a lot of furious parents who said that it would be grooming. Um, children, oh yeah. Wow. yeah. We've got room on this doll for two buttons. Okay, we've got the tummy <laughs> one. Great, belly button. Brilliant. Can anyone think of where we should put the other button? You know, <laughs> the hand. There was or... also uh, um, Play Doh had a the Play Doh mountain cake, cake mountain. Sorry, the play set that came out uh, re- recently for Christmas. But the um, extruder, you know, it looks like a syringe yeah. yeah um that you would put the play-doh in to do the icing on the cake yeah is incredibly phallic like incre- like <laughs> oh, no. if phallic enough that it definitely wasn't a mistake <laughs> wow. children won't understand but you know <laughs> yeah yeah is there like the equivalent of beat deafness where you're just yeah phallic what, like, and product, sexual like, product, innuendo. Bl- innuendo blindness yeah. like tobias in arrested development where he does, <laughs> yeah. doesn't yeah. understand yeah. all his innuendos yeah, yeah exactly yeah. i um hosted a make away takeaway on citv which obviously went so well they decided to close the channel and um <laughs> <laughs> But uh, that was an arts and craft show. It was really, really fun. But the amount of times they had to stop filming because they go, uh, it's looking a bit phallic. Like oh, anything that oh, you would really? make. Lo- anything. like <laughs> event, Because anything you make, there's something. There's usually a moment where you have to make something that's sort of like sausage shaped. It feels shaped. like that might be your problem. <laughs> if everything you make yeah. is looking a bit phallic. She's doing it again. I'm like, like close the guy channel. Close the channel. Shut it down. It's like close encounters of the third kind with the mashed potatoes. Like oh, I'm yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland. James? At James Harkin. Andy? At Andrew Hunter M. And Beck? At Beck Hill Comedian, or Be Chill Comedian, if you spell it wrong. Well, actually, no, you spell it the same, but you just pronounce it differently. <laughs> yeah, uh, or you can go to our group account, which is at no such thing, or why not email us on podcast at qi.com. You can also find all of our previous episodes up on our website, no such thing as a fish.com. But why bother listening to our podcast when there's a far superior one out there called The Problem <laughs> Squared by our guest with us today, Beck Hill, and also one of our very close buddies, mathematician Matt Parker, amazing guy. Um, Beck, give us a quick uh, rundown of the podcast. Uh, our listeners send us problems and we we solve them. Matt solves them and I I help. <laughs> <laughs> are they maths problems or personal, personal. problems? Uh, most of the ones that Matt answers are maths ones, and the ones that I solve are uh, uh, yeah usually personal or creative. <laughs> right. Yeah, like right. how big a burger can you fit into your mouth? Nice, cool. And how's it going? It's it's doing well. It's doing well. But we have set our sights on. We're trying to surpass you guys in terms of uh, positive reviews. So. We're on uh, 2,000 five-star reviews on Spotify at the moment. You guys are on 11,000. So wow, wow. we've set our sights on trying to beat you. We've told people not to then give you less than five stars. Okay. We've just told Thank them you. to not vote for you at all. <laughs> <laughs> give us five stars. Okay, cool. I've That's a, a pro- weird backhanded I've, compliment, isn't it? I've got it? a problem yeah. I'm going to be writing into your show with, Beck. <laughs> 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 All right, well, do check it out. Also, Beck's brilliant kids' books, Horror Heights. They're amazing. The third one's coming out very, very soon. It's, uh, just come out. Yeah, just come dead, out. dead Ringer. Dead Ringer. Check mm-hmm. that out as well. And uh, come back next week for another episode of the two-star reviewed No Such Thing <laughs> as a Fish. We'll see you then. Goodbye. Goodbye.